I mean, it's a disgrace how our media reported on that, um, still bringing up these uh, narratives that, you know, we just have to send in more weapons, you have to send in everything more, you have to do more support, and then they will achieve their goals militarily. And I'm not the military expert, but I just can say from the way, from the one-sidedness, that something is just not right, that uh, it's it's the media are in a kind of propaganda mode at the moment. And this, of course, destroys, even in Switzerland, the um, the ground for a neutral behavior because people say, oh, okay, oh, you you have another opinion. Oh, you're, you're on the side of Putin. Oh, if you're neutral, you're helping the aggressor. That's That's wrong. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal, and today I've got the pleasure of talking to a fellow Swiss. I've got with me the editor, publisher, and former member of parliament, Roger Köppel. Mr. Köppel worked for many years as a journalist and at a young age became the editor-in-chief of Die Welt, one of Germany's flagship newspapers. He later became the editor-in-chief and owner of the Weltwoche, a Swiss weekly magazine, rather on the conservative end of the media spectrum. Between 2015 and 2023, uh, Mr. Köppel was a member of parliament for our national conservative party, the Swiss People's Party. Mr. Köppel, thank you for coming online today. Thank you for having me, uh, Pascal. It's a great pleasure. Um, Roger, I wanted to ask you about your experiences with publishing uh, content in, well, let's say Europe. I mean, you're you've been wor you worked in Germany. You you're, you are now working in Switzerland. And I've just talked a couple of days ago to a former. Uh, a uh, news editor who worked in the Swiss uh, in a Swiss TV station before, and I've worked in, uh, to, uh, I've talked to a British uh, journalist as well who wrote a book about how the boomer generation basically started changing uh, uh, journalism itself toward more a, a um, uh, an environment in which journalists are supposed to to do good and to be part of the right narratives. Now, you in Switzerland have been very famous for, for not publishing the things that others publish. You're, you're looked at as somebody who's uh, with, 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 um, with alternative views. In, and some people really appreciate that and other people really hate that, especially on the left, you've got many enemies. Um, do you think that um, publishing in Europe has been getting harder and more ideological over the past 20, 30 years that you've been working in journalism? <laughs> well, maybe sometimes I overdid it. <laughs> Therefore, the, uh, the, the approach uh, probably was a bit uh, clouded by um, some um, very, I would say, some very heartfelt kind of, heartfelt kind of um, interventions. Well, I would say I didn't have for a long time a specific theory about journalism, but the longer I think about it, the more appealing is uh, the Die Weltwoche to me, because Die Weltwoche is a very old newspaper. It's the oldest Swiss weekly that's been founded 19, 90 years ago, and it has always practiced a unconventional journalism. Um, with a lot of debates and a real plurality and diversity of opinions. And probably in my younger years, as many journalists, I was more in love with my own points of view. And I thought it important also to, to have in certain discussions and to present it a coherent view about this or that and the longer I work, and especially today, and this somehow answers your question, I think especially today it is extremely important to um, always go against the grain, always to question the official narratives of good and evil in order to, um, to um, question these um, very self-confident um, opinions and 
narratives and uh, and perspectives that that we see in the media. And therefore, I would say today, the Weltwoche tries, and I try to do that as well. We try to offer a lot of a variety of of, of uh, points of view, not just the conservative point of view, but of course, the main duty is to go against these narratives, to question it, to bring another perspective. And I would say that since a few years, it is very one-sided. I mean, it was also it was always a certain kind of a bias in the media, mainstream, whatever you want to call it. But, you know, with COVID, climate change, and now especially with the war in Ukraine and these geopolitical tensions, we have a... Um, I, in my eyes, an, an extreme um, conformity, a conformism of opinion, even in Switzerland. And this is good for us because we can we can somehow mix it up a little bit. Um, mix it up a little bit, but have you ever had a moment when you thought that um, there are things that you would want to publish, that you would want to talk about, but that you cannot on how when you get these moments how do you how do you how do you deal with them of course you have to uh, always respect your readers you have to uh, think about your readers and um of course also about, about your uh, advertisers and you always have to think i mean am i the the general without troops you know am i just running uh, way ahead of the group and do i really try my utmost to convince to convince the people or do i more do i argue more from a perspective of you know of being convinced myself and trying to force a certain perspective or a certain investigation on on the uh, on the readers so i would say um you you always think about this in polarized situations let's talk about Russia or the war in Gaza, and you see, oh, it's uh, there is a lot of tension out there. How far can I go? And I always had a, a very simple rule. I said, um, I publish everything that I could defend in front of a group of thousand people who are militantly against the article against the opinion or the, the result of an investigation that we have researched, would I be able to explain to this group of thousand enraged people what we are doing? And could I convince them? And if I have a, a feeling that, that I could do that, then I do it. If I think I'm on too thin ice, I won't publish it. That's a smart way of dealing with it because at the end of the day you will be attacked, right? Uh, for for certain things that appear in your paper. Um, now, have you found in because you you published issues rather to the to uh, let's say conservative side of things, but you also have lefties who write for you. I mean, I just wrote an article for you, um, and and which. Which groups at the moment do you find easier to work with on on the ideological spectrum? Well, with the war in 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 Ukraine, I was uh, between all the chairs. You know, I was really, I was at that time. I was still in parliament when everything uh, took off, and um, from the beginning, I I brought another perspective. I was uh, I was always mistrust. I'm always mistrusting. You know the. The overall demonization of one part is uh, very, you could say, simple-minded um, analysis. You know that in a war, I mean, every war is a, is a, is a continuation of politics, as we have learned. So you have to understand the politics uh, before a war. That's what you are doing in your great discussions you have with uh, with different people, and this is what will be offered. And the climate at that time in Switzerland was you had to be against the Russians. You had to condemn the Russians because otherwise you were like a, a fifth column. You were a traitor. You were, a, um, you know, you were a supporter of, of the Russians. And this, um, you, you could say, moralizing perspective, which was blind or which 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 tended to be blind um, towards analysis, I was I was uh, I was attacked from all sides. But I was noticing that as soon as I 
you know, start to to get deeper into the, the 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 discussion, to bring in different writers, different authors, that people started to think. And the interesting thing was, I now have um, people from the right wing side who are uh, just you know shaking their heads and said, saying, "What what is the matter with you? You're totally wrong." Then I have people from the conservative side who would say, "Finally, you noticed the uh, the, the 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 bad qualities of the American." you know, foreign policy, and you have always also people from the left, which is very uh, astonishing. We have contributors like Oscar Lafontaine, the former um, president or leader of the Social Democrats and, uh, you know, the the, the, the doyen of left-wing politics in, uh, in in Germany, also from, from Austria. I, I noticed that the, the classical ideological um, front lines are somehow broken up. And I would say that it's so important, and this is the essence, I would say, of our uh, of our culture. And I would say you are you are also in the same genre. I mean, you are a, an intellectual, you are an, an academic, and you take the freedom to question everything and to bring in perspectives that are otherwise too much in the dark. Sometimes, yeah, and, and and you work on that, and and you try to do it better and better to hold the conversation open. And I think this is so important at the moment. And um, I feel that that you get um, interesting responses from all um, ideological camps. But of course, you still get a lot of uh, attention and and criticism when we publish the whole Tucker Carlson interview in our. In our newspaper, I mean, I got some uh, uh, furious emails, you know, and they said, Roger Koeppel, now you have definitely crossed the Rubicon. This goes way too far. And then I start to argue. I say, come on. I mean, we have to, <laughs> you, 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 you have to listen to the other side. You just cannot bunker yourself into your own perceptions. doesn't work like that. Why do you think that, because I, I perceive it the same way. I Right now, we are seeing a huge, maybe not a realignment, but a reshuffling of what used to be classical party lines and party, not lines, but, 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 but topics, right? And we see this very interesting kind of coming together of conservative and, and lefty sides. We see that in Europe, we see that, that, that in the United States, you know, uh, Tucker Carlson on his show several times interviewed Jimmy Dore or Glenn Greenwald, you know, the, 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 the lefties of the US and the, the real ones, not, not these, the, the kind of, yeah. Uh, the, 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 what 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 do you call them? Kind of the, the democratic left, but mm -hmm. the the actual the the people who who want to change the political system itself. Um, and we've we've seen them aligning, and we see that I think happening in Switzerland too, to a to a good degree. Because I just also started this kind of left for neutrality. Um, uh, 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 a little call for that. And we had a lot of problems getting um, traditional social democrats, especially social democrats in parliament to sign up. We didn't get a single one, but we got a lot of communists and a lot of um, unionists who sign up to the to this cause, which is something that uh, is currently demonized as being conservative and right wing or even even ultra nationalist right wing. And we see this this working together. Why do you think is that? It's an interesting question. I would say this is um, a human characteristic, of course, that um, societies, the majorities, or the emotions, whatever you want to call it, start to overwhelm a lot of people. And it always takes a bit of courage to stand out. And if we take this war as an example, of course, I mean, the people have not the detailed knowledge of foreign policy in the eastern part of Europe. I mean, Putin, uh, the Russian president, is generally in Switzerland viewed as a as a as a autocrat or even a dictator. Um, there not there are people who come out from the Cold War, then they see the military aggression, they see the small country against the big country, and so your emotional sympathies are automatically. 
and probably on the side of the of the little one, you know, of the attacked, of the uh, and and you know that the, the further context is not uh, is not taken into account. And what I think is a, is a, a special characteristic of our time is that this politics of emotion, of um, of um, you would say moral absolutism, that you start you tend to. Um, to to attack everybody and to uh, disqualify him morally if he um, disagrees with you. We have seen it in the the climate discussion. I mean, I'm not against um, protection of the environment, but basically we didn't have an open discussion about what's the best way to address this. You would be automatically um, um, attacked as a climate denier. You had the whole COVID discussion where our government had a huge amount of power and we were also automatically uh, questioning this, not not because we said there was no virus around or there was just a world conspiracy, but because this is the essence of democracy. And this kind of of dominating um, discourse um, which was perpetuated by the government, by most of the media, and by the by some kind of a more majority. I don't know whether it was a majority of people that, that created an atmosphere. And when we came out finally of the COVID discussion, then started this war in Ukraine, and the emotions started to rule again. And I have complete mm-hmm. understanding for these emotional reactions. But I think it's absolutely essential in order to preserve democracy, in order to preserve an open debate and a discussion, which is important because only with an open discussion, a controversial discussion, you see two sides of a problem. So you can decide better if you have a one-sided discussion, you have a one-sided decision. And therefore, I say it's the absolute duty and the freedom of intellectuals, of academics and of, of journalists to question, to falsify with Karl Popper the official narratives. And it's striking, but it's probably also, um, you could say, um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, um, en- it's enlightening at the same time that this whole system of media and so-called critical discourse um, is, is, is too embedded into this conformism and is too uncritical and um and it is just very strong what is the reason for that hard to say probably because <laughs> our societies are very wealthy and you um start to take the um the easy way you could say of, of moralizing and you're not curious anymore you start to think about your own perspective uh, as as the, the 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 measure of all things it's interesting to say but i would say regardless of the reason the more one sided a discussion is the more you have to mistrust it don't trust anybody don't trust anything question everything and this seems to me the the, the only path you can you can go yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. Um, but maybe one more thing about Switzerland, because this is something that I read a lot in international media and that I also get as questions is how is it that Switzerland gave up its neutrality? And of course, as a neutrality researcher, I would immediately answer, look, we have to look at this in a very differentiated way. And the Swiss government says we didn't because we keep into the law of neutrality, blah, 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 when it comes to the hot shooting war between Ukraine and Russia. Uh, but in the structural uh, in the structural conflict, we've taken sides. We are with the good ones versus the evil Russians. And um, But this, this is actually by the Russians. The Russians, they understand that, right? So they don't look at Switzerland as neutral anymore. They've said so. They didn't accept us last year as the... uh, as the the, the protecting power of Ukraine and so on. Um, If I look in my research at how Switzerland acted and reacted during the Second World War and even during other wars, I see a far stronger tendency toward actually maintaining some form of political equidistance together with, uh, you know, keeping to the law of neutrality in some way, one one form or another. But this has changed now. And you've been in publishing and you've, you've been working on this for much for longer than me. You've seen what Switzerland did in the in the early 2000s, right? And, and written already about it in the 1990s. Is this a trend that comes from this post-Cold War era? And are we just like thoroughly embedded in the... Western world view, or how do you explain this political siding of Switzerland? 
I would say it has um, started even back in the 60s or in the 70s when the, the left was was attacking neutrality in Switzerland, saying it's a, it's a lie, you know, Switzerland was never neutral in the Second World War. Um, you, you, you delivered weapons uh, to the Nazis. And I mean, this is an interesting discussion. You could argue for a long time about it um, because the, the, you could say the, 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 the relativization uh, of, of neutrality started after the Germans won against France and Switzerland was encircled um, by, by, by uh, fascist uh, powers. And it was a question of existence uh, and you had to, to bow under the pressure to a certain degree. But uh, Churchill said at the, second, at the end of Second World War is that Switzerland was a strong defender of democracy and of, of the rule of law in, in these very, very difficult times. So I think the left overdid it with their criticism. They were right in saying Switzerland created some kind of heroic myth of neutrality, which is not true, but they kicked out the baby with the bath and said neutrality as a concept is uh, obsolete, and um, and we, which I think is not the case. But this is the way I was also formed and educated in school at university. Neutrality had even at that time a very bad name, but because of the um, of the, at the end of the Cold War, because of the situation that we were not confronted with these kinds of wars, um, the, the question of, of, of practical neutrality didn't come as, as urgently as it is here now. And I see in, in Switzerland a general ten- tendency since many years to give up this neutrality. I mean, you can look at our government who started to, um, to um, interfere in uh, international discussions, you know, they started to to give comments on this and that. They said, okay, we were a pro-NATO uh, intervention in the war in Yugoslavia, which is, uh, by the way, um, everybody says we didn't have wars in Europe uh, since um, dozens of years. Um, Russia, that's the first war since the Second World War, which is not true. The people are forgetting we had a war in, in NATO um, NATO war in, in Yugoslavia. Uh, Switzerland was against it. And then there was the the attack of the Americans to the Iraq. And then the Swiss government, um, no, Switzerland was for the intervention of NATO in Yugoslavia, but Switzerland was against the NATO intervention with the, the Americans in Iraq. So you didn't have a coherent position. And now what I saw at the moment when the Russians walked in, I just saw the, the total triumph of emotion and for me, it was interesting that even on the in, in the in the right side of the spectrum, um, FDP or SVP, these are the more conservative liberal parties, and there were so many people um, who fell back in this Cold War logic, and even newspapers like the Neue Zürcher Zeitung, which I worked for for eight years, and and I was uh, I mean I mean the sweet the NZZ was the strongest defender of neutrality during the Second World War, and they. Give, they just throw it out of the window. So there is really a tendency that of um, Switzerland giving up itself in 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 in, cert, in in several ways. You know, also vis-a-vis the European Union, where we try to integrate ourselves even more and giving up neutrality, which of course is a very demanding position because you're you're holding distance to the good guys and the bad guys. And everybody wants to have you on his side in a war. So the neutral position is, in spite of what our media write, they say, well, that's the that's the profiteering position. It's a, it's a, it's a position of cowardice. On the contrary, it takes courage. It takes backbone um, to, to, to hold the distance. And I hope, I hope that neutrality will return. And I think it's so important because in your program, when I uh, watched your interview with the former ambassador, Jack Matlock, at the end of this conversation, you came to the point where even the American ambassador had to say, we have to find new spaces of neutrality because in war times, a neutral space is the only hope for peace. I mean, if you don't have a neutral place, a, a, a wide field on the map, where should the haters come together? Where should the warring parties start to talk to each other? 
Otherwise, if you don't have a neutral country like Switzerland, a permanently neutral country, only the weapons rule. And this is a bit the situation we have now. Yeah, you know, the problem is that the logic, I call this the logic of war and the logic of neutrality. The logic of neutrality is one that tries to de-escalate because it naturally wants to keep a distance from both uh, centers that, that go to war with each other. And the logic of war wants to get rid of these neutral spaces because it works against them. And it's not 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 somebody, but that's just how a system works, that, that it's kind of action and reaction. So as soon as we have a war, you know that there are forces that will try from both yeah. sides to diminish the impact of the, of the neutrals, right? And make them smaller, smaller. And we've actually seen this uh, the, the neutrality becoming smaller. The, on the other hand, wars always lead to to uh, to new neutralities and new neutral spaces being born. Um, so I'm not I'm not that worried. The, the, the thing is, we might lose the the know how how to how to uh, 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 use neutrality uh, smartly because you can you can do a tremendous lot of harm with it if you look at the way that neutrality was first destroyed and then and then yeah. completely discarded in Ukraine you know yeah and Ukraine you know and the, and the important and the important thing is if you and this is it, it just comes together for me as a as a Swiss and as a journalist I would say as a neutral as a, a as a citizen of a neutral country what is that you could say the philosophical ground of neutrality I mean you can argue of course uh, you can say, well, neutrality, that's that's a way of doing business in in war times. Uh, which, which it is. is. All, yeah, but it is it it's also true. Is. It's true. It's I mean, if you go back to the, the when when the uh, neutrality in the Swiss history emerged with our uh, mercenaries, of course, um the the, the very weak Swiss uh, confederation, the small Swiss confederation, not so weak, they were militarily quite strong. They said, well. We don't have anything to export. If we export ourselves as mercenaries, um, we um, we shouldn't um, go into wars with too many others because then we have no more, more clients. I mean, there was always a certain degree of surviving, um, also financially or, or um, economically in in in, in war um, warlike times. But I would say that um, after a certain period. Uh, Neutrality became the formula which enabled Switzerland to survive so many difficult wars, the 30 years war, the first world war, the second world war. And the philosophical ground of that is to me that you start to accept that war is some kind of a terrible reality and that you cannot in almost Every circumstance, probably not in every circumstance, but in almost every circumstance, there are always two sides of a story. Every warring party is absolutely convinced that they are right. So you have yeah. to hold a certain distance. If you don't accept this distance, if you think that you have psychologically the duty to always take sides, to give moral absolutes in order to make sense of what is happening, then you're destroying so the mental framework of neutrality. So if you want to be a neutral country or a citizen of a neutral country, and especially as a journalist, you have to enable the people to gain a certain distance to these emotions which uh, necessarily come up and these pressures you mentioned before, because every war party wants to drag you in. And how can you keep the distance if you're not willing or if you get not presented different perspectives. This is why it is so dangerous that the media are so one-sided. I mean, I would say we have propaganda now in the German-speaking media. Let's look at the situation on the ground in Ukraine of Djevka. I mean, it's a disgrace how our media reported on that um, still bringing up these uh, narratives that, you know, we just have to send in more weapons, you have to send in everything more, you have to do more support, and then they will achieve their goals militarily. And I'm not the military expert, but I just can say from the way, from the one-sidedness, that something is just not right, that uh, 
it's it's the media are in a kind of propaganda mode at the moment and this of course destroys even in switzerland the um the ground for a neutral behavior because people say oh okay oh you you have another opinion oh you're you're on the side of putin oh if you're neutral you're helping the aggressor that's that's wrong switzerland was neutral after Germany invaded Poland in 1939, and Switzerland was not on the side of the Germans, not at all. And also morally, personally, the people in Switzerland, they were not on the side of the Nazis, probably well, a few were, might be. But this is the problem today, that with these kind of one-sided media and this kind of propaganda, unfortunately, we have, you destroy the, the, the mental base of, yeah. of neutrality, I think. I agree with you, which is one of the reasons why I pay a lot of attention also in these programs on the impact of propaganda, because propaganda feeds into the logic of war that <laughs> works against, mm -hmm. well, neutrality of countries or journalistic neutrality and so on and so forth. Uh, Roche Köppel, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very much, Pascal.